All right, it says I am live and I am back. Um, and I made it a little early, even though I had to do updates to my laptop. And it seems as though every time I'm going live that there needs to be an update to my laptop. <laughs> that happened to anybody else? Like you have something important to do and it's all of a sudden like, you know, you need to do something or the other. Anyways. I see it popping up on my device. Let me share it with people. Ah, oh, how was everyone today? Um, I'm a little early, so waiting for people to jump in. And yeah, seeing it popping up. People are jumping in, making sure I get people to jump in. You know, because it can be lonely in regulation sometimes. So let me know that you're hearing me okay and everything. Um, you know, because I'm still working on the bugs. <laughs> but yeah, let's do this. Let us do this. All right, people, I am back. We are going to be talking about risk assessments here today. If you paid attention to the thumbnails, you would realize that, um, you know, there has been, and to the community spaces, that I had a poll out a few weeks ago, and it was so crazy that I had a poll in terms of what topic you would want to have a live where I do basically a masterclass or some sort of coverage um, and it was four topics and three of the topics tied. I think it was planned. I think people want the content <laughs> because I, I did not imagine that to be the case. So today's discussion is going to be about risk assessment frameworks, how to, you can develop and implement yours while avoiding common pitfalls. Um, does it sound sexy? Probably not. <laughs> But it is one of the areas where I think um, people who are really trying with compliance often have some issues. They fall down sometimes. It's not really good. Um, and so we're going to cover a number of things. Why you need a risk assessment framework in your compliance environment, your compliance ecosystem. I'm going to give you some tips to help you develop and implement a risk assessment framework. Um, this is not personalized to any one industry, although in this particular one, I think I might focus on the banks because even if you're not working in compliance in a banking institution, most people have a bank account. So you have some engagements with the banks. Banks tend to be in the news pretty often. We'll even touch very lightly on what's going on with the banks in the U.S. ecosystem. Um, but this is not about banks. This is about risk assessment frameworks. We are also going to look at some of uh, a bit of a sneak peek for some upcoming changes here um, to Ignus. <laughs> um, and then we're going to wrap it up, bring it all together. Hopefully I make sense and that I am actually adding some value to what are busy lives of compliance professionals. Now, before I really begin, wow, I have been doing the shorts. I've been trying to stay really um, consistent with the shorts, and I've been seeing the subscription numbers go way up. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of my subscribers, new and old. And if you are getting to tune into my lives or you're cherry picking prior content, or you just laugh at my shorts because some of them have been purposefully very entertaining because compliance compliance and regulation is not sexy. Let's, let's just get that out there. It's not. But if you can, it, I, I try to bring it over in a way that helps people to understand why it's important and for specifically for the compliance professionals to help them um, navigate some of the challenges that they would have. And part of doing that as a regulator, I have seen things. <laughs> I've seen a lot of dark things. 
Um, and some of you know, you know, this is not something that I hide, but it's also not something that I market, which I've seen other professionals um, out in financial services do. When they have exposures to certain crises or frauds or issues, they tend to advertise that as one of their strong points. And I don't necessarily do that. But those who know me know that, you know, all the papers, I was kind of somewhere there, try, you know, basically triaging situations. Um, I've been involved in beyond just low local or international uh, scandals and trying to make sure that, you know, you address realized risks. I've seen compliance officers do have a lot of missteps, but I've also had a lot of exposure with international standard setters. So I've kind of seen where the sausage is made in relation to what comes down the pipeline and is then um, configured to local laws. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of experience that I hope to bring to you and help because it's, it's, there's no sense in you making the mistakes yourself. You don't have to make all the mistakes. Hopefully I can help you avoid some of them. Now, if you are here and you've not subscribed to my channel, please do. It's completely free for you. And it helps me to reach more people who are interested in compliance issues. Uh, and like, you know, today's topic or any other topic like AML, CFT, governance, regulation, prudential supervision. There's a lot of space in um, compliance. And uh, yeah, so that is part of part of part of it. The live is about to get going. So if you know someone who is going to benefit from this content, make sure you share, 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 <laughs> and share again. And again, thank you for joining me. Now, as for most of my content, that's if not a short, I have to issue a disclaimer. I am a financial services regulator. I am not a lawyer and I am not a professional advisor. And the views on this channel are definitely all my own and they do not represent the views of any regulatory authority, any competent authority or international standards set up. So with that out of the way, let's dive in. So we are going to be looking at why you need a risk assessment framework. And I, I always speak to... Um, the need for context in assessing a lot of things, right? Because you would see things, but you might not have the context of what are the circumstances around how something has evolved and developed. So a quick look back could help you understand why we even need a risk assessment framework, especially if you've not been in the space for more than 10 years. So over the years I, that I've been a regulator, 21, which means I started regulating at the tender age of three, I've seen regulation and compliance requirements move from rules-based to principles-based to risk-based. Now, you're probably wondering why the change. Well, the short answer is that everything evolves. And, you know, it, it's just how life is with all systems. They evolve over time. Um, you know, rules base was where the requirements for a form were to comply with a set of rules. However, forms were able to still follow the rules and they have bad things happen or <laughs> there are, you know, just really negative consequences. So you want to make sure that um, you have a number of things in place to prevent bad outcomes. But if you're following rules, but bad things still happen, maybe the rules are not working. And there are a lot of examples of this happening in the past, but an easy one I can think of that I still hear cropping up from time to time. I think people, you know, sometimes need the context because be careful what you ask for. Um, I've heard people saying that um, with the due diligence process, people would ask, well, why doesn't a regulator just tell us what to do and we can do it? The answer is because they already did that once. And when you got into trouble, you blame the regulator. And it's one of the reasons, at least in my opinion, that a lot of regulators are quick to say, um, you know, um, get your own legal opinion or, um, you know, take X, Y, Z approach, but they're not necessarily giving you um, the, the rules per se, rules of the road, but you do need some sort of regulatory clarity. So this is not to equate a lack of regulatory clarity for um, rules, you just have to ask for rules. You have the systems in place, you have different things going on. But again, if you blame the regulator, how is that going to work out for you in the long run? So let me try to set out an example where I can really give it, you know, some, some body. 
You are told to collect. The rule is you collect two forms of identification for your due diligence process or your KYC or know your customer. And you do that. But the client fraudulently obtains identification and the regulator comes to find you. The defense is that, well, we did what the rule said. We got two forms of identification. So the hapless form who's just following the rules that the regulator set are not to be blamed. Maybe the rules were flawed. Maybe we shouldn't be fined at all. And that has been some of the types, you know, I'm just kind of fictionalizing it, but that essentially is the root of a lot of the arguments that took place over the years with a lot of the rules-based systems. Now, some of these arguments were long before I was in regulation, um, when rules-based was really in its heyday. Um, but drilling down, you can see that, say, you get two forms of identification and the driver's license or the copy of it, in the case of a fraud, looks like it was drawn with crayons and that the form ought to have known. Now, as I said in my disclaimer, I am not a lawyer, but that's a case that seeks to establish mens rea and what a reasonable person would do and the rest of it. And these are fodder for intense legal battles. So rules-based had its flaws and was transitioned away from that to principles-based. Now, principles-based regulation. That was now a high-level set, so high-level high report, high-level standard, high-level principles a high level set of principles that forms were expected to comply with. And so this was to move away from being prescriptive, get two forms of identification. To, so, you know, in terms of meeting your compliance requirements and towards less of a detailed rule so that, you know, you have a high level requirement. Well, you know, get identification documents to make sure that you address who is the client and, uh, you know, take all measures to, ascertain that. Well, if you're, well, it seems simple enough, right? Well, if you're guessing not quite, you'd be right, of course, because you know, we evolved to something else, risk-based, risk-based everything. But let me not jump ahead too fast. So principles-based regulation became very in vogue around, I think it was 2004, 2005-ish, with some high-level principle statements might have sound something like, oh, take all efforts to comply with AML, CFT standards, or to conduct your business in a manner that is fair and clear to customers. That latter one is almost, I, th I think I'm paraphrasing the former um, UK regulator, the Financial um, Services Authority. So was it services? FSA. And they were split to two regulatory bodies, the FCA, Financial Conduct Authority, and the Prudential Regulatory Authority. Um, but that was a lot of the language that was in their principles-based uh, regulation that regulators around the world were looking at because the UK was trying to establish itself as a leader in the space of regulation. But guess what? That was more legal fodder for conflicts. And this is by no means an attack on lawyers. <laughs> you know, you have a job to do too. But guess what? Even with principles-based regulations, bad things still happened. So using the same due diligence examples, a principle, is, a principle may be that the firm should take our effort, efforts to ensure that it has robust measures to ascertain the identity of clients with whom they do business. I am not reading from actual principles based. That is the language that is typically used. So then based on what I said, then you would have a firm or savvy lawyer or even, you don't even have to be a lawyer. Just, you know, engage brain. What does all efforts mean. Hmm? <laughs> Someone could ask, well, if the regulator knows what all efforts mean, why don't they just tell us? And to a large extent, and in a lot of situations, these are both fair and unfair questions. And now I'm beginning to sound like a lawyer, but you know, don't hold that against me. But what I want to get across are two points. Even with principles-based regulation, there were gray areas. And that the second point, and I think sometimes the more important point that I try to express to some of my friends is that regulators don't become experts in the businesses that they regulate. So you might be regulating a bank and as a past banker, it doesn't mean that you're an expert in banking and banking operations. Um, there are very few of those breeds that still exist right now because things have become so specialized that you could be working in a particular industry for years. And if you've not moved around that industry, um, in different spaces, especially at the foundational levels, you might not even know all of the things. I've heard people with deep roots in banking ask, 
how does correspondent banking work? And I'm like, and you want to regulate it? You know, it's scary because what happens is that you can have regulators developing rules that are not appropriate for the business, which is why I am also of the view that there needs to be more, not less dialogue between the regulators and the regulated. But, you know, get, let me get off the soapbox. So you had the gray areas and you had the fact that regulators are not experts in the business that they that they regulate, right? So a lot of what happened in businesses, especially and still happens today, especially in the early 2000s, was still developing along with technological advances. And for me, I, I think, you know, I came along at a very interesting time. Um, I The same FCA, well, FSC in the UK, when they were upgrading some of their regulatory systems, they extended trainings to regulators around the world. I attended that training. Um, one of those trainings, a very great December, <laughs> December in London, not fun, but I attended one of those trainings, I think it was 2003. And again, it was all the rage about principles-based regulation. I mean, and I'm going to date myself here. Remember, I began regulating at the tender age of three. Um, but when I started to walk in, you know, word perfect was still the word processing tool of the day. Some of you probably never heard of that. But there were also other important developments that led us to um, risk-based regulation. A little water. The important development was, in the early 2000s, was that this was a lot of work. And you had people who were focused on the operations, but not necessarily on all this other stuff. No, as some people might say, all oh, this other ish. But there was a recognition in the early 2000s that there was a need for a dedicated professional to address these issues. In comes the compliance officer. Compliance officers and compliance as an industry is now one, well, since 2010, formally, when they were really paying, when, you know, the Thomas Reuters and the rest of them <clears throat> were paying attention to the space. They recognize that this is the fastest growing industry. It still is. Um, I read a report by the same Thomas Reuters. They put out an annual publication called The Cost of Compliance. It's not in the description below, but I'll find it. I'll link the thing because I'm, I'm sure they're out with like the 2023 report now. But they looked at the cost of compliance and in the report I read, it was maybe just as we were entering into the global shutdowns and everything. So it didn't factor in what was going on in the world in the last two and a half years they estimated that the cost of compliance was going to increase to by like 25 or 30% to by 2025, and we're not that far away, to $425 billion. Of course, when you have a need to be met and limited people, you have, you know, the supply demand inequalities will sort themselves out. So you pay the compliance officers what they want. But in a number of jurisdictions, you still had a lot of blowback and you still had toxic cultures that didn't embrace compliance. And again, I am a little off tangent, but it's important to get this in. In the early 2000s and coming up to the first decade of this century, the 21st century, in 2007, eight. You could, well, if you were paying attention, I'm a big time nerd. I look at all kinds of things. Um, the global financial crisis was actually presenting itself. At the time, I was a junk faculty at our local community college teaching a course called Financial Markets and Institutions. And a lot of the concepts in the book were now becoming real, the whole too big to fail in moral hazard. And what was revealed that even all the leaders in the space of embracing compliance were still getting it wrong because they thought compliance was an add-on and not necessarily a holistic tool to help the form. Now, that's a lot to say in relation to the development of compliance as an industry within financial services. Compliance as an industry exists in other spaces as well, but my expertise is in financial services. But what else was going on is that in in that time, FATF had been activated. Now, FATF was established in 1999. Um, I could probably find some links, put that in the description below. Actually, I'll put something in the community space so you can find it and you don't have to come back to this description. Um, so look out for that. I'll put the thumbnail for this in the community space with a little edit to, so that you know that that's the material. But they were truly activated with the horrible events of September 2001. 
Um, that's when you got the special nine recommendations and all of that. But more importantly, that when bad analogy, but when the dust settled, um, they saw that firms who had been used by bad actors should have known that they were being used to launder money and finance terrorism. So the work that they were doing was also escalating. And other international standard setting bodies were also very much turned on, like they were switched way on. And so like IASCO, the Standard Setter for Securities and Investment Business, IAIS, the Standard Setter for Insurance, GIFIX, the Standard Setter for Trust and Corporate Services Providers, but also other bodies like the United Nations and IMF, all of them are activated, but they're all also observers of FATF attending FATF plenaries. Um, and I've attended a few FATF plenaries myself. In those plenaries and sometimes with the work plans that are developed in each individual organization, it will be emerge, it will emerge that they're cross-cutting issues that they can join up and work on. So I mentioned all of this, you know, and all of them, um, well, not all, because there are other bodies as well, um, in the compliance issues in that particular ecosystem, because you get a lot of attention around AML, CFT, and those are the examples I'm using today. But the risks go beyond just AML, CFT. Um, also, if you were paying attention, you might not be because, you know, compliance is its own thing. FATF assessments were also rules and principles based, and this is my opinion, um, right up until the third round. When they came into the fourth round, everything moved to risk base. And within the community of international standard setters, that shift happened, so enter the risk-based approach. Now, on all of that background, I know it was a lot, maybe maybe it's more than you needed, but on that background, we can look at why you needed a risk assessment framework because, you know, the risk-based approach was developed. But let's drill down just a little bit more to bring some, you know, some more clarity on, on that. Each single industry has inherent risks, and these risks can result, some risk, can result in form ending events, meaning the risk happens, you are out of business. And it doesn't necessarily just mean a regulatory risk realized where the regulator shuts you down. You could have another risk and you end up just form ending event. That's it. Chuch out. Goodbye. You know, <laughs> you get home safe. But there are so many risks that can then result in the form being used or the victim of scams and more. So you have a lot of other risks happening. Somebody slip and fall. That's a risk. You know, you're a supermarket, somebody slip and fall. That's an actual risk, right? So what do you do? You make sure you have the signage for wet floor and you have your cameras to make sure nobody, you know, pouring out a Coke on the floor and then throwing on themselves and saying, oh, I've been injured. Supermarket, I need millions to, to you know, you, you put in risk mitigation strategies. And that's a simple one that kind of like, you know, everybody could understand. But with farms and focusing back on financial services. The worst thing is, is that you could even have farms be the perpetrator of frauds and financial crimes where you have rogue operatives. So employees who just have gone to the dark side who scam and fraud clients are worse. Worse can happen. Sell their information, all sorts of things. And all of these have compliance requirements, but all of these sectors have the inherent risks. So how do you keep track of them all? You can't say you have your risk assessment framework in your head because I am so sorry. That seems really, really subjective. That's in your head. What metrics can I apply to your gray matter to determine whether that's an appropriate risk assessment framework? They're working on too much AI technology from my liking. And, and a lot of people have been trying to use chat GPT to hack compliance. And I've proven in a couple of recent LinkedIn posts, not there yet, not even close. So you need to develop your risk assessment framework um, to help you make sure that you have objective measures for these risks and that you consider you have a place where you can review to, con to ensure that you've considered all the risks. Now, I developed a fillable risk assessment checklist as a tool to help compliance professionals a few months back. If you're interested, the link is in the description below, but this is this live is not to sell you anything. This live is to help you with the risk assessment framework. Now, it's one of the most comprehensive tools that any firm has to develop. And mapping all of the risks from a se sector-specific typology report, and they do exist. So banking, you might have um, a number of bodies, Wolfsburg groups. A lot of people will publish a lot of things about 
risks in a particular area. Um, and so you would look to your international standard setter to see what they've recently published or updated in terms of risk. FATF, of course, as it relates to AML CFT risk. But even beyond that, you're looking at towards national risk assessments done in your countries. So in each individual country, by now, a risk assessment framework should have been um, completed and published in some form or fashion. And that would help um, in terms of helping you understand the risks that are relevant to your country. So using a risk in terms of AML, CFT, money laundering, and all of that, you have criminal, a higher level of criminal activity in some countries. And in those countries, you know, you might have more criminal activity as it relates to gangs. And um, so you have like kidnapping and extortion and the like. So that might be a higher risk typology in that jurisdiction with its mix of business operations that doesn't necessarily exist at a similar level in another jurisdiction. You should also look at past failures within your farm. If you keep having an issue of non-compliance, yeah, put it in your risk framework. Because unless, like, um, let me just a little segue on the ladder of enforcement. I used to be ahead of enforcement. So the ladder of enforcement is a mechanism well, it's a system in terms of applying enforcement action to a licensee. And you consider what the breach was, the gravity of the breach, what controls they had in place, what they did to uh, mitigate that. The breach still happened. Did we, did we, the regulator, find it out or did the firm report it? So, you know, speaks to compliance culture, blah, 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 blah. But if this is also a repeating risk, then, you know, if you just gave them, say, a warning letter in the past, I know it's like, well, they're throwing caution to the wind and they're breaching the same thing every freaking year. Then a warning letter cannot walk again. <laughs> then you, you, you know, it might be a light fine. All right, here's using, you know, just an example, $10 fine. Naughty, don't do it again. They do it again. Here's $50 fine. Naughty, don't do it again. Then they do it again. Your ladder of enforcement has to keep going up because the purpose for enforcement action, think about it, in any, any area, is to dissuade bad behavior and to encourage positive behavior. If you're watching from the United States and paying attention to what's going on in the federal system, in federal courts with um, SEC versus Ripple, I am not using that as an example. I also follow the space. I'm also into crypto. Watch some of my past videos. You'll have a clue as to which side of the fence I come down on as it relates to regulatory clarity and certain cryptography-based um, businesses. But with that said, you would ratchet up the enforcement based on what the breach is if it keeps repeating. So that's something that, you know, it might be helpful for you to consider. But if you have past failures within the form, add that to your risk assessment framework because clearly whatever you were using to detect and mitigate that risk wasn't working. And that means whether the regulator has detected them or not. Because <laughs> some forms might be like, well, they didn't, we get away with that one. They didn't realize. So let's just, you know, um, and look at realized risks that happen in similar forms. So a bank collapse, you're a bank, you ain't want to collapse. Have a look and see like, well, what happened over there? <laughs> you know, I mean, and it seems simple and straightforward enough, but it might be like, like what, what happened? What, what, what was their issue? And how can we not have that? Right? Because you don't have to make all the mistakes yourself. At least I don't think so. Maybe some people think differently. I don't know. But now, you, if you're AML focused, you might be thinking, but Simone, what happens to the product, country, client, delivery channel, service risk, all of those other risks that you're doing in terms of assessing client business? I can, and, and all of those things that happen in and around due diligence and AML, your due diligence process, your know your customer process, your AML framework is not the only aspect of risk. That is a big one because a lot of firms think like, all right, we got this, we got that. You have statutory compliance requirements as well. So for some firms, you might have a minimum number of directors that's prescribed by law. That's a compliance requirement. It's not a reg, it might not be in your regulatory um, laws, 
but it might be in your company laws in certain jurisdictions, certain forms of a certain type or size or whatever the whatever the, the, the qualifier is has to have certain things. You might have to have this type of committee on your board. Um, so all of those things feed into and, and then what are the consequences if you don't have them? All those things feed into it. So the short answer as to why you need to develop your risk assessment framework is to have a risk matrix that helps you to objectively, not subjectively in that it's in your head, but objectively assess risks and implement measures to prevent risks from occurring. Now, if you're finding this helpful, I see some thumbs up, thank you. Please share with your friends. And if you haven't already, like the video and make sure we can help people get a little more clarity on compliance issues that at the end of the day, they, they impact everybody, right? Sounds fair? So let's go on to tips now. So we've spoken about that. Let's go on to tips to help you develop and implement a risk assessment framework. So how exactly can you develop your own risk assessment framework? Well, one of the th tips that I think would be useful is to start by creating a set of matrices where each matrix will address related aspects of risks. Now, I've spoken about matrices in the past video and no, I'm not talking about NEO and Trinity, but for your risk assessment framework, how do you look at risk? Say the risk of money laundering or other financial crimes occurring. Ask yourself, how can those risks occur in your farm? Really, and I, I think people sometimes think it hard and, and just think, oh my God, this whole big thing and it's really difficult. Really think about it. Don't just rely on the typologies either. I personally like to try and break, like if you bring in a new system, I like to try and break it. So I don't know. It, it tends to help you develop a more resilient framework. But a good example I like to use is theft of money from a bank. And I've used it in past trainings. How monies were stolen from the banks in the 1920s is far different from how they steal it in the 2020s. In the 1920s, you know, they were... <laughs> If the money is going across state or wherever in the U.S., they ride up, you know, they try and get that, the, the carriage and everything because the Wells Fargo logo has a stagecoach. But, you know, over the decades, bank thefts evolved. You got to the 50s, 60s, where you go into the institution, somebody has a handkerchief over their face and a gun and a note and they tell the hands and money. Some of the risk mitigation strategies, the banks then got to... Um, put dye packets in, and I'm sure they probably have even more sophisticated, maybe the dye packets have tracking things on them. I don't know. But you don't steal money by, I mean, I hear it still happens in some countries, but you don't steal money from a bank by going in with a mask on and a note and a gun saying, give me all the money in the cash bag. That's not how it happens. How do you steal money from a bank in 2023? You hack it. So, of course, your risk mitigation strategies have to be central around your cybersecurity positioning and, you know, make sure you do your penetration testing and all of those things to make sure that you safe. you know, there's multi-factor multi, multi authentication and two-factor authentication, but, you know, you also need to have your internal controls to make sure somebody isn't helping criminals on the outside. You know, they have the phishing, phishing training that's added to trainings for staff and financial institutions. So there's a whole set of things that you would now do to mitigate risk of monies being stolen from a bank in 2023 that you couldn't do because the technology wasn't there in the 1920s. And the risk was, you know, the risk is still the same, money being stolen from the bank. The risk mitigation and the typologies are a lot different. But let's stick with the banking example. How else can monies be stolen? If you've been paying attention to the different things that have happened in the Caribbean, um, namely in Jamaica, with the SSL um, story, where it's an investment brokerage house, I believe it is. I had a post on LinkedIn about it a couple of weeks ago um, when it, the story was hot. But this is basically uh, an investment firm where Usain Bolt was stated as having some sort of his... Uh, monies from all of the earnings from his epic <laughs> track career. But monies can be stolen by staff. That is a risk. And in the fraud triangle, they look at risk, opportunity, and rationalization. So you have the risk, them stealing money, opportunity, 
can they steal money? What's like, you know, is nobody looking at me for me to pocket this right here? And the rationalization. Oh, well, you know, I could steal this money because the bank makes millions and they, you know, they don't pay the staff enough. And, you know, the dividends to the shareholders are huge. Well, you know, they've told us we can't get an increase. And in fact, they're cutting down our operation, you know, whatever the rationalization is. So what do you do to mitigate against this risk of a staff member stealing money from the bank? Remember, you have to be able to both prevent it and detect it. So when you're developing your risk assessment framework, consider both of those angles. So what are some of the things? Well, in banks, we're sticking to banks. Banks typically have a lot of cameras. Some obvious and some not so obvious. Um, for tellers and other, you know, wherever money is flowing, they have balancing procedures. They have sign-off procedures. If transactions get above a certain amount or for certain high-risk clients, you may rotate staff without notice. And so the staff will come in today and realize like, right, you're not there today, you're here. Um, and you conduct internal audits and there's more. But all of that, all of those things that I just mentioned is in relation to staff stealing money from within a bank. But think about it beyond that. There's so much of the risk mitigation in the bank is to remove the opportunity from a potential rogue member of staff. Now that example, like let's stick with it, right? Because again, we're familiar with the banking construct, at least more familiar. Let's do it again from the perspective of a customer using a bank to launder money. How can they do that? Again, think about it. What needs to be in place to prevent and detect it? Well, you need robust due diligence procedures as one, but that's definitely not the only thing. You need transaction monitoring, but you also need systems that alert you to triggering events and more. Now, those are just examples. But in a case that involved a real bank in the U.S. in a U.S. city, a biggish one, I think maybe a couple million people, maybe about 10 years ago, they got hammered by their regulator in terms of enforcement action for failures in their risk assessment framework. Now, they had a, a, a customer. The customer owned a shop selling candy. The shop went from depositing maybe $5,000 a week to over $5,000 a day. And that triggered no checks. Now, some may say, well, Simone, you know, maybe it was getting close to Valentine's Day or maybe they upgraded to high-end candies and chocolates with, um, um, cho I quite like chocolates, but chocolates that come from, you know, um, sustainably farmed areas and fair trade where the farmers get good wages and all that stuff. And that that could validate their case. And that wasn't the case at all. What was worse is that the candy shop was about two blocks from the bank. So a simple walk by <laughs> would have been enough, not even a drive by, just walk by. And they would have known that they would, that store did not have even enough traffic for the $5,000 a week. They didn't have the footprint or the stock at that location. Did they have other locations? I don't remember, but they didn't have, but they were depositing it from that location. So even if they had other locations, they didn't have enough business to deposit that kind of cash. And that story even got more interesting because um, that was one of the stories where when the, the tellers were running through the cash, through the machines, the counting machines, they were getting sick or high or something. And that didn't trip off any flags either. So, you know, it's it's quite a few things. Um, but let me get ahead of myself before I get into the pitfalls, because that's definitely a pitfall, but let me rein myself in. So providing a few tips. Tip number one, when you develop your risk assessment framework, consider including at least one matrix that has the regulatory compliance requirements linked and linking it to what are the, what is the law or sections of law. So for like record keeping here in the BVA, you have section 38 of the regulatory code and you have different sections of the AML TF code of practice um, and in terms of due diligence and all those different things. So you would have certain legislative requirements that overlap, right? So your record keeping requirements and all of that, you have what are the due dates? So if you have something to file, what is the due date for that? If you have to file something to the regulator or you have to maintain something and that something 
falls away. So you fall away from your minimum number of directors because one of the directors unfortunately didn't wake up this morning and it sounds morbid, but this stuff happens in real life. So you actually have to pay attention to real life issues and what you need to do. Um, you know, what do you need to notify the regulator of? Scheduling requirements. If you have something to file, how much lead time do you need? Do you need certain key persons? Do you need other? And if you need key persons, have alternates for the key persons. Because if the last two and a half years have not shown you how fragile life is, I definitely can't. But in terms of a tip, in terms of that matrix, it's something to build out. And you should also map in what are the possible consequences of non-compliance. So should it really hit the fan and you have to do this thing now, what are the possible consequences? Because you need to have your mitigating factors. But that's just tip number one. For that risk assessment framework, consider including a matrix that is specific to your regulatory compliance requirements. Tip number two. And a lot of compliance professionals that I speak to don't necessarily do this. Tip number two is, and it's painful, I know, review your country's national risk assessment report. And if done within the last, say, six, seven years, if they've done a mutual evaluation, review that report as well. I'm kind of on the fence as to how to view some of these FATF mutual evaluation reports. So they lots of acronyms in lots of these um, international standard setters. And if you're not in the compliance space and I'm keeping, I'm spitting these acronyms, like FATF is a financial action task force. So I apologize if, you know, that that is something that was, that you didn't caught, catch immediately, but they have more. So the initial evalu evaluation report, they also have four follow-up reports. And so sometimes <laughs> I've seen follow-up reports where I literally thought, well, the forest flying, because, you know, countries are wanting to make sure that they demonstrate that, you know, if they had a little slip someplace that they've addressed it and they're updating the follow-up reports and they're updating so often, it's like, well, yes, four is flying. So that's my little personal nerd joke. I understand if you don't get it. Um, but both those documents, your national risk assessment report in your specific country and the mutual evaluation report and any follow-up reports in relation to the FATF mutual evaluation conducted can help you to understand the risks that are of, a, are of more concern in your country that may not be as pressing for another country. So that's tip number two. Tip number three, make sure that your risk scoring is properly calibrated. Remember, a PEP, a politically exposed person, cannot, cannot, will not be low or medium risk. The whole papers on the risk-based approach as it relates to politically exposed persons. Make sure you interrogate your framework, whatever it is, beta test it. You have to do this, and, and maybe this is tip 3.2. Test it before you implement the entire thing, please, people, because what happens is that forms will be like, right, this is great, and they don't do sufficient testing, and this is for any system, not just a risk assessment framework, but they implement the entire thing and then realize far too late in some cases that it doesn't work. Uh, and, you know, the, the not working thing is a scary one, but I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit. So you had risk um, tip 3.1 and 3.2. Um, tip four, make sure that significant risks, these are the risks with higher probabilities and higher consequences. These are the form ending risks, get visibility and are understood by those within your form who are the decision makers. Don't give anybody plus and bold deniability. Don't give anybody the opportunity to throw you as a compliance professional under the bus. I understand that compl compliance professionals can get bogged down. And they try to highlight the issue of risks, but directors become numb to the efforts. And you're like, but I told them, and the director's like, no, you didn't. Why is that? It could be, you know, and don't shoot the messenger, but I've seen this happen sometimes. And, you know, I've had compliance professionals come up to me after conferences where I've had the opportunity to speak about a particular topic and they've asked me my views on certain things. And in speaking to them, I realized like, okay, this is because you have probably not refined your communication and you're highlighting everything. Don't do that. 
don't do that. I have a video. It's, you know, it's some of the common mistakes of compliance professionals and the characteristics of compliance professionals. But one of those is to communicate effectively. Do not data dump on your directors. <laughs> I might have to find, form that into a nice little pun or something. But so common pitfalls, right? I was getting ahead of myself a little earlier in relation to some of the common pitfalls. Now, holistically, you can have technology that can and oftentimes is used to develop these frameworks. But not because you have a nice, pretty tech platform means it's a cure-all. And that is, not, that is without fault. That is... It's so important because, you know, any system, garbage in, garbage out. But many an electronic risk framework built are not fit for purpose. You, you, you watching now or later, you have to test it. I know you have a lot going on. And I've heard compliance officers say that, you know, they have challenged systems only to be shooed off, like, you know, go away. This is a system, this is designed to help you. Being shooed off by the directors and other managers, only for that same system to embarrass the entire firm when the regulator, say the regulator, financial intelligence agency, or other competent authority comes in, and for whatever reason, you know, go to the system, and you're, for all intents and purposes, demoing the system, and it fails miserably i.e., yes, you test it, you pull up a client, the client is involved in high risk, everything, and the PEP, and is married to a PEP, and has PEP children, and they are rated low risk. Your risk assessment framework has failed. <laughs> so, I mean, and in the news, again, risk assessment framework, so this for this year, I think I did a live on this. Um, there are tons of examples of common pitfalls. Um, another common pitfall is not implementing one at all. And, you know, that one, FTX, FTX is a story that, you know, it's a case, there are a couple of case studies still being written out there in the public space, but FTX is one of them. And we'll get to like Silicon Valley Bank and thing as well, just briefly. But it's interesting to see that each of those institutions had risk realizations that were brushed over. People are blaming crypto for FTX and Silicon Valley Bank. And in the case of the latter, it may have been that, the, no, both are, both are different issues. FTX was fraud, plain and simple. Fraud, 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 fraud. People were like, oh, they didn't have a board and they're offshore and all this. And I was like, you know, in the early days, I'm like, nobody is going to be licensed in the Bahamas or in any of these larger financial services centers without a board of directors. No, a lot of window dressing went on, plain and simple, but it was a fraud. They got into business, they were getting people's money and they were just doing what they wanted. Remember Carol Ellison of Alameda, who was also connected to FTX, said that, you know, being comfortable with risk is very important. She said that on video. It's on you. You could look on other YouTube channels. Just look up FTX risk on YouTube and look for the videos yourself. You don't even have to watch a, something longer than five minutes to see it. It's just scary. Um, Silicon Valley Bank and some of the others, uh, what they had was interest rate risks being realized. So they had a lot of treasury bonds that were bought when interest rate was like next to nothing. And they, for accounting purposes, I was an accountant and an auditor in a former life. Um, well, I was two. <laughs> um, our equivalent of ca cash equivalents. And of course, as interest rates have been spiking, they are now uh, underwater with their holdings of treasury bonds. Um, but you also had issues of poor governance. I believe it's Silicon Valley Bank, who had a chief risk officer walk out on the form almost a year before they crashed. And based on reading the tea leaves, the chief risk officer was highlighting some of the issues. Now, I'm saying chief risk officer, and you're probably like, what, Simone, I'm I thought you were talking about risk is compliance as well, but some firms are big enough that they would validate having a chief risk officer and that chief risk officer could be dealing with everything upwards to enterprise level risk. However, I've said it in a past life. The chief risk officer is not superior to the chief compliance officer. If anything, they're supposed to be equals and they're supposed to have clearly defined worlds and they're supposed to have synergies because you want the ship to sail properly and sail not in stormy seas, but around the weather. Um, so another pitfall, third pitfall. So you get three today. 
Another pitfall is to not holistically look at your risk assessment framework. So you have one, but you've implemented it and never look back. <laughs> and so you've had it out there for more than five years, not reviewing it, not updating it. And if, you, if you're in a fintech space, you need to be updating your risk assessment framework almost annually at this, at this period. Because the risks in DeFi, I've done presentations on DeFi. My blog for DeFi will finally be coming out soon. And with cryptocurrency exchanges and with some of the other um, businesses that are around digital assets and payment systems, the risks are emerging and the typologies are developing every single day. But make sure to learn to tell what is a risk and what is poor governance. Everything is not, once you hear DeFi or crypto or digital, everything is not about that, the digital thing. A fraud is a fraud. Poor governance is poor governance. Um, you know, deficiencies in their systems and control, internal systems and controls are deficiencies. Learn from the mistakes that others are making in this space and adapt. And even if you're in traditional financial services, so trade fi, if you're in that space, the fintech industry and some of the cataclysmic failures that are happening are lessons for you as well. Don't get overconfident and say, you know, these young innovators thinking that they're above it all and everything else. No, 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 no. You, there are lessons to be learned from everyone. Now, another aspect, this is not a tip, but this is just a comment. I, you know, just something that has been emerging from my different discussions in different places is that there is a very real difference between theoretical compliance and applied compliance. That's why I'm here. And it's one of the reasons that um, I think I found myself teaching actual compliance courses at our college for a number of years. Um, and even engaging with compliance professionals. You go off, you get your ACAMs, and you get your ICA. And I've made a very bold statement. Those qualifications are great. They can only take you so far. Because guess what? The applied compliance can be painful. It's worse than just, you know, grating your knees or something from a fall. It can be career ending for some compliance professionals when they get certain things wrong. And what is painful for me to see um, is that you have compliance professionals who are trying their best and sometimes just end up in an unfortunate situation. So, you know, if I could help one person, then I've done my job. But I can talk about risks for a long time, but I'll stop there. And the next topic, preview of upcoming changes. So my channel made two years this month. And there are so many things that, you know, well, first of all, yay me, because <laughs> I've been consistent for two years, more or less. But there were so many things that I planned to do when I started out on this uh, journey. And then life happened. And I have to give a special shout out to the members of Chasing Compliance. That's my membership. They get access to just about everything first. It's still, you know, we're still working some bugs out, but, you know, they get access to non-public information. And that, that is the safe space where compliance professionals can share and um, engage. There's more coming that will be announced in relation to chasing compliance um, in terms of beta testing and everything. And I love them so much for sticking with me. I really appreciate all of them. Um, when I came back home and my father passed away unexpectedly, I was going to shut down the membership. And each and every one of them told me that they would stick with me. And I cannot thank them enough. They said, don't do that. Do not do that. <laughs> that they're going to stick with me. And I cannot thank you guys enough for that support then and for your support now. Thank you. So one of the things I planned and one or two people were privy to, you know, I was working on the, the cover note, cover art and everything um, is a podcast that was being planned a long time ago. That is coming this summer. The catch, it'll be for my members only. It'll have a lot of content. Um, will it be publicly accessible? Um, I, from the research that I've done, some of the podcast episodes can be made public um, with a paid, you know, paid per episode type thing. So if I do an interview or something like that, or you know, it's one of those where I'm 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 okay with it being public, then fine. It'll be available for you know whatever the rates are. I don't know, you know, still 
working on some backend stuff. Um, beyond the podcast, the publicly accessible content will always be there. Um, and feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. I post there most often. Some people have asked, well, why aren't you on Facebook? Facebook is not where my audience lives. And even though I do have some of the same compliance professionals in Facebook, Facebook is not the platform for, for compliance. I'm sorry, it's not. It's it's just not. Um, I've gone on there. I've seen compliance groups with, you know, 40,000 people not active at all. Um, LinkedIn is where the game is at. So you can always follow me on LinkedIn and follow me personally or follow my business page, Igna Solutions. Um, there's always content there, polls for voting. I do LinkedIn exclusives. I was challenged to a rap recently. Um, and it's one of the areas where I beat chat GPT. Um, so you could just check out my profile and see what's happening over there. Um, I'm also wanting to add that I'm considering a bit of rebranding. I've had also what I've been blessed with is amazing support with my core team at Ignus that you do not see. <laughs> <laughs> there are people behind me that help behind the scenes because while I know a lot about compliance and regulation, I don't know so much about some other stuff. And I will be the first to admit it. You can't know everything. Um, their work is definitely paying off. And to you guys, you know who you are. Thank you so much. Um, what else? What else? Um, yeah, check the community space. I'm going to post later today, tonight, or latest tomorrow with some links um, to other things that I mentioned. I'm probably going to have to rewatch this to make sure that I don't miss anything. And um, definitely on, on LinkedIn and on in the membership, there will be a post. Um, the membership is going to get you know more detailed notes. Um, so let's wrap up what did we cover today. Why you need a risk assessment framework. A few tips to help you develop and implement a risk assessment framework and the common pitfalls. And, you know, I think some of the takeaways are that um, you have to test it. You have to test it like you mean it. Um, all risks are not equal. And a bit of a concluding point. Um, that I have, and I've had the discussion with regulators, other regulators in other countries, sometimes quite forcefully. There's no such thing as 100% compliance. So stop harassing forms for it. It does not exist. Even the best compliance framework can that you can find something to improve, that doesn't mean that they're bad people or that they have bad compliance systems. I liken 100% compliance to achieving speed of light travel. Right now, with the technology exists that exists, it's not possible. We ain't traveling faster than light. We ain't getting 100% compliance. That is my opinion, my opinion only. However, there are ways to get closer to that. And it's, you know, it's even why I named my membership Chasing Compliance, because trends and risks and everything change. And so compliance and regulation, and everything changes to try and address those changing risks and threats. So you're forever chasing this thing called compliance. Um, so yeah, a little bit of backstory. So before you go in the description below, there is a link for a free compliance tool. Get it. Even if you're in non-traditional financial services, so DNFBPs, designated non-businesses and professions, um, so real estate, high-value dealers, NPOs, that tool is for you. That you can, ev everybody can use. It's small mom and pop operation. You're setting up today as a law firm, and you are going to be engaging in activities that have um, that brings you in scope for AML CFT compliance. It's for you. Go on ahead and get it. Go and get it. It's free. Um, and you don't have a system in place, you know, it helps you think about how to develop that. So, and it's reusable. You could use it and reuse it and you know, it's completely free, no obligation to buy anything. What else? Well, I think I could end it here because I've been going on for almost an hour. <laughs> But I'm definitely looking forward to continuing the discussion and sharing my passion for compliance. Beyond that, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, where you can also follow Ignis Solutions Limited. I really hope you found today of value. Um, and if you're watching this after the live, 
um, you know, feel free to comment or reach out to me. There'll be lots of opportunities to do so. Um, the next live is going to be sooner rather than later. So if not next week, week after, um, and you know, there's going to be a lot more in store for you. So I'm looking forward to each and every one of you. This has been great. This has been Simone. Simone Speaks. Compliance, regulation, everything else. That's a little hint to some of the rebranding that's coming. And thank you for staying with me till the end. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Definitely have a good one.